2012, Eugene Victor Debs was running for president under the Socialist Party of America. There, there are some folks who consider Bernie Sanders to be the Eugene Debs of today, but that isn't really true. Right. In 1884, back in 1884, Debs was elected to the Indiana House of Representatives. He was a union man, right? And henceforth, he introduced a lot of bills to help the families of injured rail workers. He gave riveting speeches that led to these bills passing in the House, but then left to die in the Democrat-controlled Senate. Debs did not, did not run for the House again because he saw the Democratic Party for what it was, a corrupt, soulless party that is willing to let its people die for money. That's what he knew about them in 1884. Debs left the party. Bernie did not. Bernie tried to reform the party from within, but Debs realized that the party is unwilling to reform. He saw that over a hundred years before Bernie Sanders. But Bernie wants to be liked by the Democratic Party. And the reality is that they're, they're, never, they're never gonna like him, right? They've spent the better part of this decade alone demonizing him and his flagship ideas, right? Bernie has become that nerd that desperately tries to win the friendship of the jocks only to get tackled over and over and over. Oh my god. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's a reality we need to face. That Bernie Sanders is no Eugene Debs. And mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, Chris Hedges, who I don't recommend if you're, if you're looking for hope. Uh, this is Chris Hedges talking about Bernie Sanders and his need to be liked by the, uh, uh, the party. And Shama pushed Bernie before the event. I was there as to why he wouldn't run as an independent, arguing correctly that we were never going to build an effective political movement in an election cycle, and we were not going to build it within the confines of the Democratic Party. Sanders' answer was that he didn't want to become Ralph Nader. Uh, what did that mean? What does it mean? Nader ran for president several times. He actually did quite well in 2000, uh, getting almost 5% of the vote. The Democratic Party had to destroy him. They were terrified. I was Nader's speechwriter. And they did. They turned him into a pariah. Uh, and that's what Sanders meant. He knew the Democratic Party machine would destroy him. Uh, they would uh, mount uh, an intensive campaign to deny him his Senate seat. That's you know what they did to McGovern. People forget George McGovern, our last the last Democratic nominee to take on the military-industrial establishment. He didn't want to be Ralph Nader. So back to Debs, right? Uh, Eugene Debs left politics, and then he went on to start the American Railway Union, and then he led the Pullman strikes of 1894. This was one of the many times that the American military was called to fire upon its own citizens to break up strikes, right? In order to prevent a general strike, which would have been a peaceful protest, the American military, under the order of the Insurrection Act, used its force, killed 30 strikers, injuring 57 others, and causing $80 million worth of damage in 1894, $80 million in 1894. Now, you know how, like, when you were kids, you know, your parents would, like, if you're, like, roughing around in the back of the car, like, your parents would be like, ah, oh, we're going we're gonna to turn this car around, you bastards, you know, like, you know, when they were threatened. <laughs> yeah, if you, like, didn't show up, they're like, oh, we're going to turn this car around. <laughs> Calling the military to shut down general strikes is basically the government's version of that, but instead of going home, it's like if your parents ran your car into a Walmart and then blamed the kids for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's basically what they did in, in, in 1894, right? The rich railroad tycoons used a bunch of their media propaganda to turn the public against unions, blaming them for the damage, blaming them for the, de de the debt, and then they put Debs on trial 
right? After, and then he was put into prison for six months under conspiracy charges. Yeah. A- after he was uh, after he was released uh, in in uh, 19, uh, he created the Socialist Party of America and ran for president five times. He ran five times. His goal was to create a system that would empower workers and reduce militarism in America. So he challenged capitalism at every turn, at every turn. And he pointed out how the Democratic Party is not really for the progressive, right? He goes on to say the radical and the progressive elements of the former democracy have been evicted and must seek quarters. They were an unmitigated nuisance in the conservative councils of the old party. They were for the common people and the trusts have no use for such a party. Where but to the socialist party can these progressive people turn? Every true Democrat should thank Wall Street for driving them out of a party that is democratic in name only and into one that is democratic in fact. Bam. How about that for some fucking bombastic speeches, huh? <laughs> Here's why Eugene Debs might be better than me is because he didn't say fuck once in that at all. <laughs> Not even once. <laughs> so in 1911, leading up to his run against Woodrow Wilson, uh, by the way, he had a, he had a train that he, he rode around called the Red Special is what he called it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, 1908 to 1911, he ran his campaigns on the Red Special. Um, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, so leading up to this run, this is, he, he said this, right? He said, we should seek to only register the actual vote of socialism, no more, no less. In our propaganda, we should state our principles clearly, speak the truth fearlessly, seeking neither to flatter nor to offend but only to convince those who should be with us and win them to our cause through an intelligent understanding of its mission. Socialism must be organized, drilled, equipped, and the place to begin is in the industries where the workers are employed. So like I said, he wanted, he wanted to empower the workers. He was literally the first true candidate that was running as an organizer in chief. In 1912, he got 1 million votes. That was 6%. He got 6% of the votes. He got no national attention attention, and was virtually a nobody in the political arena. And he still got 6% of the votes. In 1918, at age 63, after giving an anti-war speech, he was in, imprisoned under the Espionage Act, which if you don't know what the Espionage Act is, that's the reason Julian Assange is still in prison, right? And in 1918, the big tough American war machine was afraid of an elderly socialist in a top hat. <laughs> so, okay, so I know some of you guys are like, Chris, you're being kind of hard. What did he say in his speech? You know, what was the 1918 speech all about? So in that speech, Deb points out the only, only the rich make war and decide the terms of the peace. The middle class who would fight these wars don't get to be involved in that process, which we don't. When was the last time an average iron worker was invited to any of the treaties of Perry? Right, right, yes. And really, when you think about it, when was the last time that you heard the word treaty in our lexicon? (laughs) The answer to that question is 1898, you guys. That's the last time. Uh, We've, since then, we've pretty much replaced the word treaty with submit. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yes. Oh, dear. Now, after Eugene Debs' speech pointed out how the middle class has been cannon fodder for the arms industry in battle for imperialistic control of power and resources, Debs was sentenced to three 10-year prison sentences and had his right to vote revoked. 
This is basically the origin of the prison industrial complex, right? Mm -hmm. We don't treat prisoners like they're people. We treat them like they're turncoats in a revolution against nothing. Now he ran for president again from prison in 1920. And he got another 6% of the votes. Imagine how well he would have done if he was not a political prisoner, you know, riding around on the red special out there. <laughs> yeah. During his time in the Atlanta penitentiary, he was a major, major advocate for prison reform because he saw firsthand what was happening. He was liked so much by the prisoners that when he got out, the prisoners made him a hand carved cane. That's how much they liked him. Hey folks, uh, thank you so much for checking out this, uh, this video. Thank you very much for tuning into this channel. If you enjoyed the video, uh, if you like what you see here, please give it a thumbs up and share this out with whoever you think would benefit from this. Share it with your friends, your family, your enemies, whoever you think needs to, to, to watch uh, content like this. And uh, I'm also gonna be doing uh, live virtual stand-up comedy shows via Zoom. Uh, called the Citizen Revolution Comedy Shows. Their tickets are available for those right now. Uh, you gotta get your tickets and, and, and you gotta get them as soon as you possibly can uh, for two reasons. One, that's how I'm gonna be able to communicate the login information to you guys. That way we don't have any unwanted visitors showing up in the, uh, in the virtual theater, the Zoom virtual theater. Uh, and, uh, and, and I'm just one man, and it's very difficult to keep track of uh, a bunch of different people that I need to give tickets out to. So uh, that's how I'm gonna be able to communicate the, the login information as efficiently as possible. The second reason to get them quickly too is because they're limited spots uh, and half the ticket sales are going to help a uh, grassroots organization, venue, journalist, uh, and so on and so forth. Every, every single week it's a brand new show and every single week we have a brand new grassroots organization or venue or journalist or, uh, that uh, we are going to be donating half those ticket sales to. So um, if you want to be a part of that, uh, please get those tickets as soon as you can. And uh, you can you can make a one-time donation, you can or you can become a sustaining member uh, by going to my website krishmohan.com as well k r i s h m o h a n dot com. Uh, you can uh, you can become a sustaining member via Patreon uh, over Bandcamp or directly on my website. That gets you free tickets to some of these live virtual stand-up comedy shows. It gets you unreleased stand-up comedy material. It gets early access to uh, my web series, Forkful of Noodles, the extended big long episodes of, of that. Um, you also get, if you miss a Citizen Revolution show, don't, we got you. We're, we'll, we put those up for our patrons and uh, our sustaining members to check out. So. I hope you guys can, uh, if, you, if you have the ability to make a donation, you do. If you have the ability to become a sustaining member, that you do. But the important thing is to make sure that you like, share, and subscribe to this stuff because content like this often doesn't get shown to the maximum number of people. So I depend very much on you guys to get the word out there. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate all the people that do tune in, uh, that have become patrons, that have made donations, that buy these tickets. You guys are fucking awesome. Uh, it's it sure as hell helping me out, uh, uh, you know, in, in this tough time, and uh, and it's helping me continue produce these shows uh, at the at a, at a higher quality than um, than before, and and keep pushing uh, to create to create these these videos to the best of uh, to the best of my ability, and add you know the the, the cooler bells and whistles to it. I'm, I'm the only person that works on these shows. I'm, I'm doing all this stuff. So uh, every every little bit, every every sustaining member and every ticket sale totally, totally fucking helps out. Um, and I appreciate the hell out of it. Thanks so much. And we'll see you at the next video.